listening to the Philanthropisms podcast with Rodri Davis. listening to the Philanthropisms podcast. This is the podcast where we try to put philanthropy in context. I'm your host as ever, Rod Davis, uh, and this week is something a bit different. Uh, it's the launch of what I hope is going to be a new occasional series of podcasts that we're doing in partnership with the European Research Network on Philanthropy, or ERNOP. Um, so we've teamed up with ERNOP um, because they have a new series of research notes that they're putting out where the idea is that they take academic papers and journal articles that have been published in the field of uh, philanthropic studies and kind of civil society studies more broadly and try and turn those into one or two page notes that can explain the contents of the research to practitioners and policymakers and other people who might be interested but won't necessarily go and dig out these articles or read them in full. Um, so in order to do that, uh, first of all, this podcast is going to be split into a couple of sections. So the first bit you're going to hear in a moment, uh, I'm talking to Barry Hullworth from ERNOP itself, uh, and also Sevda Kilichalp, who's from Philea, which is a big uh, European infrastructure body for philanthropy, who have also been involved in this project on the practitioner side. Uh, and I talked to Barry and Sevda about what the thinking was behind the project, what the aims of it are, what they hope to get out of it, how it's going to work and that kind of thing, just to give a bit of framing. Uh, and then there's three mini interviews with academics whose work is actually featured in this first series of research notes. Um, so you'll hear me talking to Giedre Lidikita Huber um, about a paper that she published on the tax treatment of donations in Switzerland and what that kind of tells you about how you might design policies around tax relief on, on charitable donations. Uh, you'll also hear me talk to Elisa Ricciuti, um, who has done some research on how Italian foundations measure impact and the various sort of different ways in which they do that. And then finally, you'll hear me talk to Malika Uacha about some research that she has done, uh, a paper all about diasporic volunteering um, between communities in the Netherlands and in Morocco, uh, and what that tells us about the ways in which people see their identity and that how that informs their approach to philanthropy. So three really different papers, really fascinating stuff in, in all of them. And I'll put links at the end in the show notes to places where you can read the research notes and find the actual papers themselves. Um, but without further ado, let's go into it. And as I say, first, you'll hear from me talking to Barry Hallworth and Sevda Kilichop. Okay, great. Well, I'm here with Barry Holworth and Sevda Kilichalp. Hi there, both of you. Hello. Hi, Rodri. Um, and we're here to talk about um, a new project that ERNOP has got, a research note uh, series, which kind of summarises bits of academic research about philanthropy. And we'll be hearing later in the episode from three of the academics whose work is, is featured in in this most recent um, series of, of releases. But it'd be really good just to find out a bit more about the thinking behind the project as a whole and how it came about. So Barry, maybe if I could come to you first and you could just tell us a bit about how, you know, ERNOP came up with this idea, what the driver was and, and what you hope the, the, the new project will, will achieve. Yes, thank you, Rodri. Thank you also for uh, paying attention to this initiative. Um, well, you know, the relationship between academia and uh, philanthropy uh, people working in philanthropy um, has been on the table uh, for 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 quite some time. Um, uh, one of the criticisms that academia um, sometimes receives from people working in philanthropy it is very sometimes um, academic research on philanthropy is hard to read. Sometimes not always easy uh, to access. And that publications are not often fully uh, relevant to the people working in the field. And to address this, uh, we have been talking to uh, uh, a lot of people in the field. 
one one of those is philea and um uh, one of the ideas that that came up is that it should be possible to translate academic knowledge to more accessible digestible pieces that really focus on the relevance of academic publications for practice so did it leaves out the the more technical methodological discussions that are often uh, cover a large piece of academic publications. It also leaves out um, a large part of the more theoretical discussions that make an academic article relevant to be published in an academic journal, but instead focus on what is new in this um, study and what is the practical relevance of this, this study. And I'm very happy that um, uh, Philea, but also European Fundraising Association, European Venture Philanthropy Association, and the Center for European Volunteering has committed to this also to endorse this this initiative that's great and, and Sevda from your point of view at, at Philea as a, a membership organization and sort of key part of European philanthropy infrastructure what what is it that kind of interests you and excites you about this project yeah I remember the day uh, Barry launched this idea of uh, creating research notes uh, we got excited really immediately and got on board um, because yeah, it makes a uh, research on philanthropy more accessible, uh, more digestible, closer to the practitioners, because the research notes really uh, summarizes the key, key findings, uh, findings, and then it stresses uh, the implications of this uh, findings for uh, research. Sometimes it's really difficult for a practitioner to go through an academic article and then to identify relevant parts for them. And uh, usually they don't have much time for this. So it is very practical in the sense that it makes their job easier. And at Philia, um, we really care about um, learning professionalizing sector and we use peer learning techniques for this. We also do uh, practitioner research, uh, but we also believe that um, academic research is really important for driving the knowledge uh, in sector and about the sector. Uh, for that reason, we really wanted to be a part of this initiative and we re really uh, value this. Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and, and in terms of why the project's necessary, I mean, you've both sort of mentioned or alluded to the fact that there is something of a gap between academia and practice in, in philanthropy. I don't know if philanthropy is unique in that regard, but it feels as though philanthropy academia is still relatively young as a field. Um, and a field in which it, it sort of needs to be closely linked to practice because it's talking about something that is kind of inherently practice based. Why is it, do you think, Barry, that that we are finding that there is this gap? Is, is it just practical things like time on the part of practitioners or are there more sort of structural problems in terms of there not being the places to bring uh, academics and practitioners together or there being kind of different incentives when it comes to what they're aiming to do with their work? Well, to be honest, I, I think this is uh, has partly to do with the way um, academia is being funded. Academia and people working in academia, as you might know, um, uh, get their uh, funds through important funding streams that come from teaching students and publicizing in academic journals and these are the criteria that that matter to them and because uh, philanthropy as a academic field has not been um, established at as such uh, it does not have a um, major or regular stream of of students and it does not have a sizable journal um, uh, there, there, there are not uh, many journals that publish articles that are related to philanthropy. There are a number of art journals, but uh, they're, they're impact factors and impact factors are very important for people working in academia. Uh, they are not uh, very highly regarded by their peers uh, in uh, of other uh, disciplines. 
So it's a relatively still very relatively new field. And um, uh, to develop this field, it is important. So it's a, a more or less a chicken or, or egg question. Um, uh, so you had, I'm very happy that, 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 that we started this um, and we hope that it will attract uh, uh, new people to the field also to study it, but also to uh, invest in the field then it might uh, become part of the more mainstream uh, research agenda that is also funded by uh, public fund uh, uh, public funding streams and then it might uh, uh, become more embedded into um, uh, research within university as a discipline so we once we coined the the term philanthropology this, this, because philanthropy is being studied by by many academic disciplines from different angles, uh, it might even make sense to 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 establish a department of philanthropology uh, within universities to focus on the questions that are relevant to philanthropy uh, from from all the the, the different angles. And, and Sevda, that, just linking to that as well, one thing I wanted to ask you is from the point of view of practitioners and those that you kind of work with in your, your network, what's your sense of the, the appetite that they have for engaging with academic research at the moment? And, and when they do, what sorts of things are they most interested in, in seeing or, or for that academic research to focus on? Yeah, I think that interest is growing, so it's um, good news. Uh, we see that there is more openness uh, for collaboration. Uh, when they collaborate uh, with uh, researchers, they are mostly interested in improving their daily practices. So practitioners are more interested in how questions, whereas uh, academics are more trying to make relationship between different things, understanding the causes, its implications. Um, so um, maybe foundations would like to understand how to create more flexible funding strategies that are aligned with their mission, but also more adaptable to changing conditions, given that now uh, there's so much uncertainty going on. Uh, so there are so many crises. Um, so uh, what I see in foundations, uh, now they would like to come up with these strategies, new strategies. So this is one place uh, academic research uh, can play an important role. Um, so they also curious about, they would like to know about operational structures um, that would accommodate and support an emergent strategy given all these uh, uncertainties. And also governance and self-regulation mechanisms um, to become more inclusive, more participatory, more accountable. These are kind of uh, issues um, that they are uh, becoming more and more interested in. And also another uh, important issue is trust-based philanthropy, like how they can build trust-based, more flexible relationship with their grantees without sacrificing the social impact they would like to generate. So these are, I think, uh, kind of questions uh, now they're interested in. It, it does feel as though there's a lot more engagement with some slightly sort of deeper questions that maybe would benefit from theoretical input so actually maybe it's a really good time for establishing more of those links um, and and Barry I was going to ask in terms of how that relates to the plans for the research note series how much of that is going to be driven by supply and, and how much by demand is there going to be an opportunity for practitioners to specify areas that they're particularly interested in so that you can then sort of look for bits of work that could be turned into research notes in those areas or will it also be sort of driven by obviously what's available in terms of the research coming out the answer is both so we very much invite our members that are um, academics uh, that have published their work in, in, in all kinds of journals to uh, submit their work uh, for being uh, translated in the Ernob Research Note format. But we also very much invite people working in philanthropy uh, to sign up as 
um, expert in which they can contribute their knowledge um, and uh, to and and as association as Earnup, we really aim to match the the practitioner expert with the academic to to create a research note. So we 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 simply uh, are a matchmaker. We organize dates between academics and practitioner experts to create these research notes. And uh, we believe that um, we, we, we need both sides to really make this stick. So um, uh, also, I would very much in, invite everyone to, uh, to be part of this initiative. And, and Sev, to just just coming to you on that, what's your hope for where this you know, research note project might go in in future? Um, from Philea's point of view, what's your your kind of ambition for it? Uh, we would like, of course, academic research to be used more. Uh, and for from Philia perspective, we would like to use uh, this research to shape our um, peer learning sessions. So it's not just about uh, talking uh, about daily practices, but there's it's also uh, informed by research. So we can look at the bigger picture and put things into a context rather than just looking at the uh, day-to-day um, developments, let's say. Uh, and we would like uh, to uh, kind of fill this gap uh, that Barry mentioned between academics and philanthropic uh, practitioners, because there will be all, always gap at least to close that, that one so that we get familiar with each other's vocabulary or expectations, or rhythms of work, so there will be more collaboration, even though you know some of the dynamics will remain the same. Uh, and from the foundation side, uh, we expect uh, more openness for research, uh, so that they open their doors to researchers, they, they invite them to do uh, research uh, about their foundations, they, about their practices. And also they support uh, philanthropy research. As Bear mentioned, um, philanthropy research needs to be uh, really supported by financial means uh, so that it can be really independent. It can be, it can evolve and it can they can publish in different avenues. And also, um, and also from the academic side, not looking at foundations only as sites for research. Of course, there 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 are, but also there are important uh, resources for shaping the research. So, involving uh, foundation practitioners, philanthropy practitioners from the beginning. Uh, in the design of their research, asking, maybe formulating research questions together and making sense of where uh, research may be most relevant. Uh, this kind of the thinking together could be really important to make research more relevant for both sides. Great. Thanks, Sevda. Um, and yeah, we're going to hear from some of the people uh, involved on the research side whose work is featured in this um, uh, this first uh, release of research notes. Barry, obviously, we're kind of at an early stage in the project. What's your ambition from the ERNOP side for how this might develop in, in the future? I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, so what I would really like to see is that um, this idea is um, will stick that uh, we will see an incremental development of uh, people that commit themselves to this project from all uh, kind of different areas, people working in different areas of philanthropy, uh, international, uh, local, fundraising, foundation, volunteering, um, because also the the the... the, the Philanthropy research is 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 very broad, um, and um, it it addresses questions related to um, why do people volunteer on uh, uh, and why um, do people donate money to charity? To what's the role of philanthropy in society, uh, and how? to 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 measure impact so uh we need volunteers we need uh practitioners from all kind of backgrounds because the 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 the, the output that has been produced by academics is 
also very broad. So my ambition is to have this initiative stick and to also to have it um, top of mind for, for people working in philanthropy, if they are in need of any information, uh, to see if there is a research note that has been published on this team and that they delve deep into uh, the, 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 the research that already has been done. Great. And yeah, we'll obviously put links in the show notes for this episode to places where people can find out more and get involved. And hopefully this will help to, to spread the word. And um, just remain to say thanks ever so much to both of you for, for coming on. Um, and uh, as we say, we'll go on to hear from some of the uh, academics involved shortly. <laughs> Okay, well, next up, you're going to hear me talk to Giedre Lidikiti Huber. Um, uh, Giedre is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Geneva. Uh, and we're talking about a research note that is based on a paper she wrote or co authored with Mar uh, Marta Pitavino uh, titled Who Donates and How New Evidence on the Tax Incentives in the Canton of Geneva, Switzerland. Um, so, without further ado, let's go into the conversation with Giedre. Great. I'm here now with uh, Giedre Lidikite Huber. And uh, Giedre, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the work that you've got featured in, in the most recent ERNOP research note, which focuses on some really interesting findings about the relationship between tax policy and philanthropic giving um, in Switzerland. Yes, of course. Uh, this is the article which was published at the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies uh, with my co-author Marta Pizzavino, which is um, a mathematician and uh, lecturer in statistics, senior lecturer in statistics at the University of Geneva. So this is an interdisciplinary study. I'm a lawyer and she was doing the um, statistical part and it was interesting collaboration. Now, our article studies basically how tax policies work in practice, how tax norms work in practice. We were really interested to know whether, to what extent people actually use tax incentives, because we see very, quite often actually in the policy discussions, regular suggestions, maybe we should increase more, uh, like provide more tax incentives because we want to uh, boost charitable giving. But then when we look into the data, what we have and the research, actually there was no, nothing on the current framework of tax incentives. So at first we wanted to know how the current framework works in order to say something, what should be, um, what should be done. And this fills the quite a big uh, gap in the Swiss research on the efficiency, on the studies on the, um, how tax norms work in the field of charitable giving in Switzerland. And, and obviously, it's specific to the Swiss context, but the findings um, are, are of relevance more widely because they actually kind of tell us something about the relationship between tax policy and giving more broadly in an area where there is perhaps less research than a lot of people would think. What, what were some of the, the kind of key things that you found in that Swiss context that you think might have wider relevance? Yes, uh, you're right to say that the relevance is wider because even though we talk about Swiss context, but the tax incentives that Swiss use, the tax deduction basically, is the most popular deduction to encourage charitable giving in the, um, I would almost say in the world. Uh, three years ago, we participated, uh, we collaborated with the OECD on the report, which is called Taxation and Philanthropy, where they did the empirical study of legal frameworks in um, uh, in 40 uh, OECD and participating countries. And they said that, like, they found that tax deduction is indeed the most um, common tax incentive. So what we study here really gives a lot of insights uh, for other countries. Now, what did we find? We have to put it in the context uh, of the discussions about tax incentives. We, uh, because the donation is usually... It's not usually, but I would say often criticized as being um, not the most effective tax uh, tax incentive and quite, uh, I would say, quite inegalitarian because it provides a bigger tax benefit to people with higher revenue in progressive income tax systems. And we wanted to see whether really higher income parents use more this tax deduction or perhaps uh, people in all income classes use this deduction uh, 
this in the same uh, in the same way and basically how these dynamics work and what we found was indeed that actually the tax incentives for charitable giving the deduction charitable uh, deduction of a donation is used mainly by the highest income classes uh, in the canton of geneva uh, which is a big canton actually with a, with a big population in a swiss per, uh, perspective not by the territory but the, by the population uh, and it's a very important canton for philanthropy so we can really kind of safely guess that the same pattern could be found in other cantons in Switzerland. And, and that was fascinating to me. I think the, the Swiss context, particularly because you have the, the national level sort of federal taxation, but also the, you know, lots of independence to set taxation laws and rates at the, the canton level. So there is variation. You almost have this big natural experiment about what happens if you set caps at different rates and also in in the time period that you were looking at there was a significant change in in tax policy and one of the things I noticed I think looking through the findings that I, that I thought was really interesting there seemed to be some s- suggestion and, and correct me if I'm wrong that um, it, in the figures that you looked at where there was a cap on deductions um, that people were limited I think to um, deducting 20 percent of their income only a very small number of people ever got to that cap anyway but actually there were there, it seemed as though some stopped at that point rather than giving more because then they wouldn't be getting a, a tax benefit which i thought was really interesting in terms of other places where they're thinking about uh capping uh deductions on on charitable giving if if indeed it does psychologically stop people potentially giving more yes so that was an interesting finding because as you said we kind of did our research studying the reform which was made in right in the middle of the data we had uh, on the cantonal level uh, because before the reform people could deduct up to five percent of their charitable uh, donation a five percent of their equivalent to the taxable income of the charitable donation, and afterwards, uh, 20%. The thing is that we had a problem with our data because we could not see what's happening after the cap. What we received in our data, we received only capped deductions, and we were had no information about the entire amount of the donation. Uh, but what we could see when we studied before and after the reform, that after the receiving was raised to 20%, a lot of people stayed at 5 uh, and that kind of that could be an indication that people were kind of targeting five percent deductible amount uh, of donations, and even after reforms, we maintained the habit to stay a bit around this level and did not increase and, and to te- up to twenty percent. Now, concerning twenty percent, we see that there is a very small amount of people reaching this threshold. Only around three hundred people of two hundred fifty thousand in Geneva. So our, our advice was that we should not really concentrate on the threshold. It's really on the ceiling. It's quite quite high already. Maybe we could have different tax incentives if we really wanted to use them to boost donations. Because the deduction, as I said, is highlighted as being uh, not the most effective one to uh, to boost charitable giving and in, in general to regulate uh, taxpayers' behavior. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's really interesting. and I, And I guess some of that goes to existing findings around whether or not giving behavior is elastic or inelastic in response to, to tax changes so it was it was fascinating to see um, I guess I just wanted to zoom out a bit and, and ask you what um, relevance or kind of insights you think that the, that the findings in this work can potentially offer for practitioners and policymakers I mean what what might they be able to do with the information that, that you found in the study uh, so the practitioners I, I I imagine that they quite understood the relevance of uh, tax uh, tax incentive uh, tax deduction for charitable giving because we see that wealthier uh, wealthier taxpayers the ones who have higher uh, taxable income they really deduct a lot and they're a lot and often that means either they get a tax advice or they are professionally informed somehow themselves uh, but they do use it now for policy making our advice was not no longer concentrate on increasing and increasing and increasing this taxable deduction because for a regular suggestion shall we increase to 50 percent of taxable income shall we increase to seven like or shall we do not set any limit to uh, for the deduction and what we see is like it's only only a few people now reach it. Well, now it's a relative uh, word because um, our last uh, set of data dates back to 2011. We do not have more recent data than that. Uh, but still, it's quite telling. So perhaps we could just think about something else. The, this concentration about increasing a deduction 
this uh, focus on the increasing of the deduction is not very, I think it will not very, very be very efficient in this framework. Uh, yeah, really interesting, because that's a very tangible finding. And I think in an area where it's often difficult to find policy mechanisms that do drive giving, uh, I, there's always a temptation just to assume that raising caps on deductions will do it. And if actually you can show that that's inefficient and ineffective, then you need to look elsewhere. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, obviously, given that we're talking about this in the context of your work being summarised as part of this new ERNOP um, research note series, um, what's your perception of the current state of links between academia and practice in the field of philanthropy? I mean, do you, do you find in your own work you have relatively good links with practitioners and policymakers, or do you do you find it difficult to to get the work that you're doing across to them? And do you think uh, something like this new ERNOP initiative can help there? So I think the new ERNOP uh, initiative is very good because obviously for policymakers and even for you know academics working in different fields tax fields not in philanthropy everyone is very busy and reading those kind of 25 30 percent of uh, pages papers uh, with full of data takes time so it's very very useful to have something summarized just in a few paragraphs uh, we have a lot of contacts with practitioners in the geneva center of philanthropy we uh, regularly organize uh, teachings seminars uh, master classes about philanthropy and we talk a lot about taxes uh, people are very interested about that so i do really have a lot of contact uh, with the practitioners uh, which is very fulfilling because they tell always tell us something that we can kind of research and uh, help with in our research. And the policy making obviously it takes a lot of time. Uh, as you said, in Switzerland, um, uh, so we have cantonal tax law and federal tax law, and also communal tax law, uh, which makes all these three levels of uh, kind of different uh, legislative powers. And um, obviously, some things are, are harmonized at the federal level, but still, it's a long process and uh, it takes time. We'll see whether this research gives some inspiration. We really hope so for the legislator. Uh, yeah, and I think the airdrop notes will be really useful in this in this respect. Great, and as you say, it in a way it brings all of them together in one place and makes them digestible. So uh, you know that makes things much easier, I think, for policymakers who do want to to take action on these things. Um, I just wanted to ask before I, I let you go. Um, following on from that work, what what are you working on at the moment? Is it is it work that kind of builds on that, or are you working in other areas? And it would be great to hear if so what those are. I am working on the cross border philanthropy, tax barriers to cross border philanthropy. Uh, this is something that we would really like to to explore more because there are a lot of unfortunately tax barriers that um, prevent um, free flow of philanthropic capital between countries which is a shame this is one topic another topic which we which i really uh, like uh, start working on and i would like to study even more is um, sustainable taxation and what is the role of the sustainability in the tax systems and different sustainable development goals especially in relation to climate warming what tax policies could do in relation to climate warming so that would include obviously uh, all the discussion about car carbon taxation but but there are many more questions as well so that's what i'm working on now Sounds fascinating. And yeah, I'd certainly love to, to hear more about that when the, when the work comes out. And um, just remains to say thank you uh, ever so much, Gedre, for, for finding the time to come on the podcast. Um, yeah, all the best with this. I hope people do take the time to read the research notes um, and be great to hear more about your work in the future. Thank you so much for inviting me. Next up is a mini interview with Elisa Ricciuti. Uh, now, Elisa is now an independent researcher, but at the time she wrote the paper uh, in question, she was working at Boccioni University in Milan, um, but this paper was actually published, I think, in about 2018. But just with the way that academic timescales work, we're, we're talking about a research note about it now. Um, and the paper itself is called Are Foundations Assessing Their Impact? Concepts, Methods and Barriers to Social Impact in Assessment in Italian Foundations. So let's hear what Elisa's got to say. OK, great. So uh, I'm here with Elisa Ricciuti. Hi, Elisa. Hi, Rodri. 
Hi there. And and the paper that you've written that's featured in this new series of Earnart Research Notes is about um, a study that you did looking at foundations in Italy in particular uh, and their approaches to, to impact measurement. So it'd be great um, just to hear a bit about the research, how it came about and what the, the key findings were. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I wrote this paper with my colleague Francesca Calò, um, and we were actually studying uh, third sector uh, generally speaking, it was in a in a kind of um, turmoil moment in Italy at that time because uh, there was the legislative process for a new law coming out, which was then named the Code of Third Sector. It was a very big thing, and third sector, as many other European countries, is very fragmented and, and very varied in, in a, there is a vast, vast panel of organization with very very different nature and, and scopes and so foundations were one of them uh, and we were in that kind of legislative process where um, there was a lot of talk uh, a lot of talking about uh, sector and foundations indeed because foundations uh, as in many other countries of course are the subject which uh, it's part of the third sector, but at the same time, uh, it has money. <laughs> so it's basically the grand maker and not the grand seeker, to, to say it in one way. And as you, uh, of course, know, uh, Italy is the only, well, definitely the first European country which has also foundations of banking origin, which is a very peculiar type of foundation uh, with a very, very um, consistent, let's say, um, uh, amount of money to invest in third sector. Uh, so uh, the, the attention of foundations was because of that particular uh, moment and that particular type of foundations we have in our country, which were at that time starting to really structure some process on impact measurement. Why I'm saying this? Because, of course, impact measurement, impact evaluation, impact assessment, I mean, let's say that in this I mean, in this talk, I would use these terms in a, let's say, in an equal way, okay, at synonyms. Uh, and basically, of course, foundations measure the, the impact, but it, it, it has never been a practice. Uh, neither to do it regularly and uh, not even to show it, so to communicate it, first of all, to beneficiaries. So this is the way that the study started. It was like, okay, we have so many interesting foundations in our country and so powerful in terms of, of resources. Why don't we know basically anything about how they measure what they do? So that's the ratio. And the main findings um, are basically that the concepts of impact are very uh, different and fragmented and this is a I mean uh, this is not a shortcoming to my view this is actually part of the richness of again uh, of course of the organizations involved there is a shortcoming which is consequent prob probably which is that it's very difficult to study this topic so it's a methodological shortcoming of course if everybody has its own way uh, view or definition of impact then it can become quite difficult to 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 agree on what it is and so in, on what it is that you want to measure. So that was the first difficulty we had. So a lot of richness in this um, and definitely a lot of approaches. Uh, the methods are different and very typically are mixed. So qualitative and quantitative. Uh, and finally, I would say that the major shortcoming, uh, which is not surprising, to be honest, but again, it was kind of a first piece of data on that topic, is that uh, there is a lack of resources to do that. When I say resources, I'm not, again, talking only about economic resources at all. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about capacities. I'm talking about the lack of skills to do that. Uh, consider that in our country, the last study on on well at that time, so it it's almost it's more than five years ago, but basically it showed that uh, the average number of people in foundation is one point five. And so it means that you know it's it's literally like one person and uh, some other people maybe part time working on foundations. So it's difficult to imagine a structure again and regular process of impact evaluation. Absolutely. And and just one thing I really wanted to ask having read the paper, because it it feels as though the, the conversation around impact measurements has, has changed over 
the last few years and probably since the the paper was was originally conceived and there's more focus now on the question of whether approaches to measuring impact take into account the power differential between the funder and the recipient and I think there's more focus on questioning whether actually measurement can be problematic if it's imposed on on grantees I wondered if at the time when you did the research you got any sense that that some of the funders were aware of those kinds of challenges or whether they hadn't really even entered their heads at that point? Um, yeah, thank you. I totally agree with what you say. And I would say a mix. I mean, of course they were aware, but I would say that uh, it was kind of a top-down uh, thing at that time. But because, again, it was really the beginning of this practice. So you start thinking that you are the funder and now your objective is measure what you do. And of course, uh, let's say the target or the beneficiary, if you prefer, is, is the object of the thing. But the idea that the beneficiary can contribute to this, uh, not to the evaluation, because of course the beneficiary needs to give you data, but to the, to the design of the evaluation, to the ratio, to the process, to the strategic uh, construction, no, that I would say was quite far. Um, you, I agree that things have changed quickly. So um, this is true because, uh, again, I remember one thing that we wrote very clearly, which was there is a very limited use of impact evaluation and foundations, which is absolutely true. But it was true at that time. And now I would say things have changed. I would never write something like this because, indeed, it has really evolved quite quickly, and that's very interesting. Uh, so, yeah, the beneficiaries, well, I would say no. The, 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 the idea was kind of top-down. So, like, okay, let's explore which methods we have, and let's decide what's, what's, of course, better for us, what suits better for in our situation. And, of course, I mean, I, I give for granted that you can't measure everything because you don't need to, basically. Um, so the choice of what to measure the choice of how to do that. How, when I say how, I mean, I will do that internally. I would, uh, you know, try to find someone externally who do this, or I would involve the beneficiary in the data collection. And it's quite easy that beneficiary feels there's like just a overload of work and data uh, to give because of course, beneficiary work on this. Uh, so um, I would say it was rather top down, and in terms of methods, there was uh, th there was a practice before. Uh, I wouldn't call it impact measurement, but again, it was a practice, and the typical practice was just um, uh, like sending a follow up questionnaire after I mean, sometimes after the project, three months, six months, one year was the maximum, and see what the beneficiaries of course responded to the questionnaire and in just in case you need it or you wanted to explore better having a just an in-depth interview so this is not exactly a method this is just of course a, a methods for data collection which is okay but um again they were starting to to uh, to to think about counterfactual methods or uh, social return on investment, which again then was abandoned because it's something which has a very, I think, evolution and then uh, an involution <laughs> at that time. So they, they just started to explore different methods, but I wouldn't say any of the people we interviewed really involved beneficiaries into the design. Interesting. And I just wanted to, to zoom out a bit because obviously we're talking about this in the context of the work being featured as one of the, the research notes um, in, in this ERNOP series. And the purpose behind that is to try and, and address, I guess, the, the gap there sometimes is between academia and practice when it comes to, to philanthropy. And I know just when we were talking before, you mentioned that you yourself have actually made the move from academia into practice. So it'd be really interesting to get your sense of whether you think there there is a challenge in bridging that gap and, and whether you think this this ERNOP series of research notes can go some way towards helping to get some of the thinking from academia into practice more effectively. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, yes, definitely it fills a gap. The gap is quite clear, I think. Indeed, it was, uh, I participated to many 
meetings and conferences, even of course at Evnov, but not only. And it's the typical uh, complaint, if you want, is that, oh, come on, we are all among researchers and there is no practice here. Uh, and to be honest, I participated also in many meetings of practitioners where uh, the complaint was, okay, there is no uh, that there is no connection to academia. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a kind of reciprocal thing. Well, yes, there is a gap. To be honest, I don't think it's so challenging because maybe it was more challenging some years ago. But, you know, now that the, I mean, we see that more and more the connections between academia and practice are are, are just obvious and evident also in the methodological thing. So for example, also qualitative research for its nature, by its nature, is is more and more full of inputs from practitioners. I would say more than let's say decades ago. So it's it's quite it's a gap which is which must be filled. I don't see it very challenging. Uh, in the sense that it's just to sit on a table and 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 discuss and and decide how to do it. And Ernev does a does a great job in, in in this, to be honest. I think. But the point is how to put this into the academic level. So if I see a challenge, is really to be as a practitioner considered in a way that is, uh, let's say, suitable to the academic level but not because academia uh, doesn't want to have feedback from practitioners but just because is how the academic incentives work so it's a different again it's a different problem so no it's not so challenging i think that academia and practitioners work quite a lot together i, I mean in this field in the social innovation social impact field at least so probably many others it's different uh, so it's not challenging, but it's something that needs to be, again, done maybe a bit more. And I think you're right, there are, the will is often there, but there are practical challenges around incentives and just things like timescales. I know as I have moved from practice into partly being in academia, the difference in terms of how fast things happen in academia versus practice makes it sometimes quite difficult to to make the two work well together and yeah, I just I, I just wanted to ask finally um what it is that you know you're working on at the moment and how your work here kind of around philanthropy has, has evolved yeah well I think well yeah philanthropy has evolved a lot I still of course work on this I just uh as we said left uh, uh academia first to to work in a startup which was dedicated to education as a bridge between academia and the third sector, the practitioners were, if you want. Uh, and now I see evolving the role of foundations is evolving, of course. And I mean, this is not, of course, my opinion, it's, it's quite clear. Uh, but also in our country, there is a lot more in terms of the role of foundations really as policy entrepreneur, uh, as uh, Let's say they they drive uh, much which much more uh, much more strategically and with much more intentionality than before. They drive some processes to be experimented uh, and to be let's say delivered uh, to the policymaker, and this is extremely interesting. And now I work exactly in at the intersection between the sectors, so I work much more with companies, with the public sector, with the third sector. And uh, I work on, on, let's say, fostering partnerships with the objective of being more impactful. Uh, very easy, but at the same time, <laughs> so challenging, it seems. Great. Well, that sounds really interesting and, and certainly wish you all the, the best with that. Um, just remain to say thanks ever so much, Lisa, for, for finding this time to come on and, and talk about your work. Thank you, Robert. Thank you to Arnav. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it was very, very nice to chat with you and good luck. And last, but very much not least, uh, we have a mini interview with Malika Uacha. Uh, now, Malika is a PhD candidate, actually, at the Rotterdam School of Management at Erasmus University, but also uh, a part-time lecturer at the School of Social Work uh, at the Windesheim uh, University of, of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands as well. Uh, and the paper that I was talking to Malika about is entitled Diasporic Volunteering in Cross-National Perspective. Is Faith-Based More Effective Than Secular Philanthropy? A Case of the Netherlands and Morocco. So let's hear what Malika's got to say. 
great. So I'm here with Malika Uwasha. Hi, Malika. Hi. Great uh, to have you on the podcast. And yeah, you're here to talk about the the piece of research um, that you have that's been featured as one of these new ERNOP research notes, which is all about diasporic uh, volunteering, particularly focused on the Netherlands and on Morocco. And it's a really fascinating paper. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about what the, the focus of the paper is and what the key findings are. Yeah, of course. So my research is on cross-border diasporic and bicultural philanthropy. So what I do is that I investigate the philanthropy done by diasporic groups from one country to another, and then um, often from a country of residence to the country of origin. And what I've done in specifically this paper is that I've been looking at two groups. Uh, One is the diasporic uh, international Moroccan um, philanthropy, philanthropists group in the Netherlands and the uh, diasporic uh, national uh, philanthropists in Morocco. So what I mean with that is that I've specifically looked at I've specifically looked at philanthropists with an indigenous background, meaning that they are part of the indigenous Moroccan Amazir uh, society. And then you have like two parts. One one of them moved from the rural area of Morocco to the urban area of, of Morocco, meaning, you know, like the periphery to the to the cities, the big cities. And I've been looking at uh, Rabat in Casablanca specifically. And what I've also been looking at is looking at the Moroccan Amazir uh, philanthropists who who really left Morocco and live in the Netherlands. And what I did was I kind of compared their philanthropy more in a sense of how do they, uh, how are they um, approached by the receiving end, which which is the same uh, receiving end, and that is the Amazir societies who are isolated, still marginalized, uh, living in rural areas with little facilities, basically. And what I've been uh, looking at specifically in this paper is how is the, like, does the receiving end have a voice in cross-border philanthropy? And yes, they do. And what I've been doing is basically talking with them, like, who do you prefer as a giver? And what they do or what they said to me is, you know, we are kind of thankful to be a receiver, but if we if we have to choose, then we will choose the international diasporic Amazir uh, philanthropists, for example, from the Netherlands. And one of the reasons that they mentioned is that the Islamic motives that diasporic international philanthropists have plays an important role in them because they say, like, you know, we're they, just as just as we do, they too are very proud to be Muslims, and then the diasporic national. Uh, philanthropists tend to be a bit more secular and less outspoken about their religious identity. And I thought it was super fascinating to, you know, it, it's really something that I came across during my own, you know, previous research uh, when I was still a student in, in cultural anthrop- anthropology. So I had to do my own <laughs> research for my master thesis and then still keep an eye on this phenomenon that was going on. So for this paper sp- specifically, which is part of a special issue that uh, Lucas and I, Lucas Meiss and I of the Rotterdam School of Management have um, have developed. So yeah, that's that's, that's my paper. Basically. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's really fascinating. And as you say, the, the finding that actually there was a, a preference for the international diasporic donors. And, and I think, as it says in the paper, that actually they are probably just more effective at reaching some of those groups, particularly the... The rural, the rural ones, both, I think my understanding was because of that religious identity, but also actually to do with language barriers and things like that, they were often more effective. Yeah, I, I, I was really surprised by that, because if you look at it, for example, from a kind of a Western perspective, you would say that from a geographical point of view, the people who are living in Rabat are, you know, geographically and physically more close or closer to the ruler periphery of, of Morocco uh, compared with the diasporic uh, philanthropists living in Amsterdam or in Utrecht or uh, whatever. And uh, that was really not the case. And one of the other things besides uh, religion was also something that they pointed out in myself, meaning, you know, your own parents were the ones who lived amongst us uh, and amongst our parents for decades. And, you know, when they uh, when they moved to Europe and decided to, you know, raise you over there, it doesn't really have to change because every summer they remained loyal to this part of Morocco. So, er, you know, all the gifts and all the remittances that, you know, there's a bunch of literature on, on the latter one, uh, but um, it was always spent on us and on our children. So, you know, we were also able to send our children to, to school because of the, you know, the money that your father or your mother sent, or I was able to dress well on that wedding because of the dress that your mother gifted me during 
the summer of 1996 or 97 or whatever. So that kind of a loyalty and solidarity that was built up from the first generation is has been really given uh has been has been really taken upon by the second generation and the third generation saying you know besides what the receiving end is saying towards our parents and grandparents we too have kind of a responsibility to continue this cross border philanthropy and sometimes they would you know phrase it as as zakat or sadaqa, I mean, meaning as a as a religious um, uh, as a religious mandatory giving, but many times they didn't they didn't, and they just said, you know, this is just heritage in a way of of a certain behavior towards a certain group, and yeah, and then I think what is also interesting is that the moment I spoke with Moroccan uh, diasporic nationalists, so the people who are uh, who lived in Morocco and performed their philanthropy from the urban areas to the ruler parts, uh, they often didn't really understand the way the ruler parts were, were living. And they sometimes were also surprised compared to international diasporic philanthropists who say, yeah, but this is my summer vacation when I went to my grandmother, you know, for six weeks. This is exactly what I what I lived through and what I had to deal with and then come back to the Netherlands and then hear my classmates speak about all these fancy holidays. And then it was my turn to, to talk and say, yeah, well, I kind of had to work on, you know, the, the land of my grandmother and walk all these olives. And <laughs> so th there's a lot of recognition and based on that recognition and based on the loyalty and the solidarity that, you know, has been given from generation to generation. Of course, the receiving end is going to say, you know, I know that you are the daughter of your mother and I know your mother. So of course I would raise my hand if you, if you are giving instead of, of a stranger. And I mean, it, one thing that really struck me was that that, that whole narrative about the, the, the preference and actually there being closer ties with people who are, who are, you know, geographically further away go, goes against the grain of a lot of the discussion in sort of international development and cross-border philanthropy about localization and, and it being ideal to try and get in-country philanthropy. And I wondered what your, your sort of sense of, of how it plays into that narrative is and what you think it might add in terms of informing policy making and practice around cross-border giving? So what I think is that it works two rounds, right? I think that one of the things I came across when I started talking about my own research from the perspective of being an academic, what the practitioners often said is, okay, sure, you're wearing the head of an academic and a scholar working on a paper, but you're always going to be one of us. Besides, if, you know, compared to if my colleague would say the same thing and then they would actually take that serious and say, yeah, indeed, you are an academic instead of, you know, so I think that's one thing. But I think if you phrase it in a way that, you know, policymakers would would actually have a certain advantage from it, I think it's really important to tell the practitioners that they are very important. And like how, how I phrase it is that I'm not an expert in cross-border philanthropy. I'm just an expert in analyzing because that's what I've been trained in doing and writing it down. But the ones who are performing cross-border philanthropy, you know, the, the actual diasporic philanthropists, they are the experts and they have the actual social capital that needs to become this fundament in academia, but also in, in international policy and, and you know, the way we can finally really localize knowledge uh, in a way that benefits all parties. So I think that's, that's that, I mean, maybe that's a huge change that that is required for us to get there. But I don't think it's impossible. I just do believe that uh, we need to change the hierarchy as it is in society. Because if you would say, you know, as what I've often seen also in my research is that people say, yeah, you know, I don't really do that much of important work like you do, who is in uni and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, what is in uni, man? We're all nerds being isolated. But, you know, and then they start talking about what they are doing in their spare time. And they're leading these incredible, huge volunteering organizations with so many different volunteers. But somehow they they are so successful in getting everyone on the same mission on, you know, leading towards a certain receiving end that is really in need of their help. So this whole management style based on religion and intuition and just, you know, a certain personal, emotional feeling of of giving and wanting to give i think there's there's a lot of 
there's a whole world to, to be gained on just that um, that way of, of working and that way of leading uh, certain things in, in, in a civil society as it is maybe, you know, internationally, but also nationally. And I think, what, yeah, one of the things I, I think is really important to get here is to um, kind of see how this gap is still being held between practitioners and academics because, you know, academics, we write for academics and we don't really write for practitioners and practitioners write for practitioners and not for ac academics. So, uh, yeah, there's this whole language shift that needs to take place in order for us to combine these two worlds. Yeah. And and hopefully initiatives like this ERNOP research note series will help with that. But as you say, it's kind of it's one part of a much bigger puzzle it's not going to solve the problem by itself and it's kind of the thing is to make use of of the things like the research notes yeah but i think it's also dependent on who makes these research notes because i mean like you as you said the fact that you 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 start the you start the conversation with saying i think your paper is so interesting i don't know what your personal background is but what i've often hear is what do you mean with diaspora i have never come across the term of diaspora so it is also you need also you also need practitioners who have this you know environment and who are used to certain conceptual terms and and you know the way we use it on in a paper but then also in 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 forms of speech so i think you know these are kind of all these uh these variables that needs to be present in order for you to actually have this conversation but i know that if i would give this specific same paper to you know, this incredible uh, woman who is a very known philanthropist in the Moroccan community, she would really tap me on my shoulders and be like, yo, oh, this is a paper of 40 pages. I think you did a great job, but I actually don't really know what you're talking about. Is that a, is that a problem? And I'm like, no, but that's a very important thing to you know, take into consideration. So like I said, this is again, the language thing and the the, the bubble, because not everyone in my environment really knows what philanthropy in the first place is no of course and I, I guess there are multiple steps between the version that is done for an academic audience and the practitioner exactly. and so the yeah. focus is not on making them read that paper it's on how do you get the knowledge contained within that paper exactly. through the steps needed to get it there and before I let you go I just wanted to ask what it is that you're working on now whether it's kind of more development of the same uh, work or whether you've kind of expanded that out a bit more um, it's kind of the development on the same work. Of course, I added a lot more data, but at the moment I'm uh, working on fine-tuning my dissertation and I am specifically uh, fine-tuning the last chapter in which I in which I compare diasporic and non-diasporic philanthropists and then specifically the international diasporic uh, phil philanthropists, also again in the case between Morocco and the Netherlands. And then I raised the question on are diasporic international philanthropists. So are Moroccan Dutch philanthropists who still perform their philanthropy in Morocco really different from, you know, a monocultural Dutch philanthropist who has um, whatever organization and is also doing philanthropy in Morocco? Is is really is there really a difference between diasporic and non-diasporic philanthropists if they are both raised and Com coming from the West. And what this paper is saying is that that is actually not the case. So I'm kind of really diving also into this diversity post-colonial conversation uh, in both, again, practice sense, but also in academic sense, in which we kind of tell the, the one man, you are a white man, and then the other man, we're, you're a black man. I think we are both. Um, also, as, as a white person, you know, you can also still have a colored identity and maybe this is a bit of an utopia uh kind of approach saying we're all cosmopolitan <laughs> but i think i think diasporic is a lot often a lot more western than they they want to admit and i think this is also uh you know if you if you read the paper that you just discussed is that of course if if this receiving end is so incredibly open in in you know literally receiving and welcoming you in the tribe and you don't feel the same type of inclusion in Western societies, whatever reason it may have or or it may cause is that of course you you will, you know, you will choose the side that welcomes you and, and yeah. includes you. So that's what I'm working on right now. Sounds fascinating. Lots of really interesting questions about identity and how that relates to to philanthropy. Um just remains to say thanks ever so much, Malika, for finding the time to come on the podcast. Um and I certainly look forward to seeing the end result of uh, of the research when it's all all finished
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, well, my thanks again to all of the guests on this episode of the podcast, to Barry Holworth and Sevda Kilichalp from Ernop and Falea, uh, to Gerdre Lidicati Huber, to Elisa Ricciuti and Malika Uacha uh, for talking about their research and the research notes based on the papers they put out. Uh, I'll put links in all of the show notes to places where you can find more detail on the Ernot project. Um, you can find the research notes themselves and you can actually find the papers if you want to dig into the detail. Um, if you're interested more broadly in issues around philanthropy and civil society, do check out the website at whyphilanthropymatters.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rodri underscore H underscore Davis or at Philitracy. You can find me on LinkedIn or on Mastodon and various other places as well. If you've got ideas for people that we could talk to on the podcast or topics we could cover in future, do drop us a line at rodri at whyphilanthropymatters.com. Other than that, just like, subscribe, tell anybody that you think might like the podcast about it, and I'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.